payoff magnitude was completely unpredictable. Like I look back at my own products, you know, I had my, my Twitter course was extremely successful by my own measures. It made over a quarter of a million dollars in just over a year, beyond my expectations. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gumroad Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Michael A., a senior writer at Gumroad, where I deconstruct the tactics, strategies, and processes of top creators. Each week on the podcast, I interview creators and digital entrepreneurs who are at the top of their field. On this week's episode, I interviewed Gumroad's head of product and multifaceted independent creator, Daniel Vassallo. Daniel and I talked about lifestyle design, his new course, A Portfolio of Small Bets, the unpredictability of creative outcomes, and strategies to deal with it. This was a wonderful conversation with a great colleague and friend. Enjoy. Our guest today on the podcast is Daniel Vassallo. Daniel, thank you for being here. Hello, Justin. Of course, very happy to be here. (laughs) Yeah, this is a terrific moment to engage with you. You're my colleague at Gumroad. We've had conversations with Sahil, our mutual boss and the founder and CEO of Gumroad. That's not necessarily why we'd love to engage with you. You're a mainstay on Twitter, former creator of user base and two successful digital products, in addition to a course that you've just launched, a live cohort-based course, which we'll talk about, and you're, you're just about to finish your first cohort of that course. But you also articulate online this wonderful philosophy of a portfolio of small bets, which just so happens to be your course title. So your your thoughts and ideas are relevant to independent creators of all kinds, our core audience here on the Gumroad podcast. So I thought I'd start there and just have you talk about potentially the thrust of your course and what you're trying to teach your students in your first cohort-based course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's an elaboration of most of the things I already talk about on Twitter. And it's fundamentally sort of based on the idea that, you know, when you're jumping from the predictable world of employment to self-employment and being a creator on the internet, selling stuff online, there's much more uncertainty involved and much more predictability involved. And many of the techniques that we tend to use in the predictable world, you know, just the focus on one thing, working hard consistency, which are good things to do, but in the unpredictable world, they're typically not enough. Right? You could work very hard on one thing, but there's such a big role of randomness and chance and unpredictable events that are significant to make sure that your business or creation payoff materializes, that you just need to have a very different strategy. Right? So it's a mix of learning and unlearning, <laughs> I would say. Many ideas that are not necessarily my own ideas, lots of ideas from other people, you know, Nassim Taleb, Tim Ferriss, Art Devaney, uh, lots of other people who sort of have been talking about sort of the role of chance in life and business. But these are things that I lived on, lived myself firsthand, sort of I've seen the benefit both in terms of, you know, diversifying my income and, you know, increasing my odds of success, I believe, as well as some psychological benefits, sort of literally about motivation and productivity and things like that. It's again, like these are things that I've been trying to promote on Twitter for free, but you know, on Twitter, there's a limit of how much I can express in 280 characters. (laughs) This has given me the ability to spend nine hours (laughs) talking with people sort of, and go into more examples, answer people's questions and sort of start to build And a a bit of an aspiration for me as well is to potentially, this is an experiment, I don't know if it will happen, but start to build maybe a community of people who sort of are coming together. We have a small Discord server where we're just discussing the topics of the course. And hopefully, at least I'm hoping that we'll keep in touch with each other and just continue to learn from each other, even myself, right? Because there's more always to, to, to learn, understand about how the world works, business works, understanding ourselves and so and so forth. (laughs) Yeah, well, first of all, in response to that, I should I should congratulate you. You announced early in November 2021 that you had your first 50K month in October, the month prior to 
And that's a wonderful thing. And you also posted, as you do, sharing things publicly, graph of your month-to-month revenue as an independent creator ever after having left Amazon. And to me, it's remarkable that it's not necessarily predictable when those months would come for you. In other words, you left without a plan. And in fact, you even recently tweeted something like, I have no plans for November. It's something like, there are a few things I have to do, but otherwise I'll throw myself at a few random things and take advantage of opportunities as they arise. And if you look back at your month-to-month revenue, it seems like that's exactly what you've done. If I try to put myself back to the years from now, I would have never imagined that I would be doing the things that I'm doing right now. Right? And that's, I think, an interesting insight, again, into the role of unpredictability when you jump into this type of career. Uh, it is not the same when, you know, in my previous life, you know, in my previous life, when I was working at Amazon as an engineer, you know, the future was reasonably predictable, of course, not perfectly predictable, but there was a clear path and, you know, I might have gotten promoted or maybe not promoted, but it was going that way. Whereas now, you know, think, t- thinking about it, you know, I had o- absolutely no social media experience, for example, when I, not only that, I almost disliked social media, you know, back two and a half years ago, I hated it. <laughs> that was my opinion. And I did a co- whole 180 degree turn. Now I, I think it's extremely useful. I enjoy it, both producing and consuming on, on social media. And I have a product teaching other people how to benefit from social media, which just goes to show <laughs> how, how, what, what parts life take, takes you. Same thing with the creator economy, right? It's not something I didn't even knew it existed or, or, you know, these kinds of things, right? And now sort of I'm part of it. I know many creators and, you know, I'm working at Gumroad and other things. So, you know, it, it would be foolish to assume that the future is going to be any more predictable. And actually, I think the right strategy is to embrace rather than to fight this level of uncertainty, you know, they require certain strategies to make sure that, you know, there are, because there are negative uh, uncertainties that, that can harm you. And I think you want to be well prepared to make sure that if those things happen, uh, you know, you're not harmed more than ne- necessary, but you need to be out there to benefit from the good fortunes <laughs> that, that life throws at you. Right? And, I, and I think to even recognize those opportunities, you ne- just need to have this mentality. Basically, that tweet you mentioned about goals, I think it's important because sometimes if we have a very sort of hard goal, especially a very specific goal, it can blind us. We literally stop seeing opportunities that might appear literally in front of us. We might be prepared to do them, but if we're just focused on one thing, we'll just our brain doesn't even see them. Right? So, you know, to benefit, benefit from luck, you have to recognize it, right? It's an important thing. And I think to import, to, to, to recognize it, you just need to be available. You need to have some free time, some slack in the system and just sort of have this attitude that unpredictability is good. You know, you mentioned the thing about variable income. It's sort of, I was just talking about this last yesterday, actually with, with my cohort. It's, you know, back in the beginning, you know, the unpredictability of the income used to make me quite uncomfortable. I, I'll admit, so it's sort of this not knowing how much I, I'm going to be n- making in three months and six months was, was weird. But nowadays, I think, again, sort of, I, I'm seeing the benefits of it, significant benefits. Probably, I think if, if my income would stabilize, it would make me uncomfortable now <laughs> because I'm sort of gaining from the stressor and even from the, from the ups, and, both from the ups and downs. Right? All of them give me signals whether to take it easy. You know, for example, this first three quarters of the year, like from January to to September, I literally took it easy. You know, I went for vacation back to Europe for three months. And I just, you know, was working mostly on autopilot. I was helping with Gumroad a little bit, quarter time basis, but I didn't launch any new products, didn't really do any marketing. I was just riding the momentum, right? And that's something that that helped me on that from that aspect. Right? There was there was a momentum, there was a high, and just kept going over it. But then, you know, July, August, September, things started to dip quite significantly. I think September was my lowest income month, probably almost since the beginning. And this is like the same thing that happens, you know, how creators say constraints breed creativity, right? And I think it's something similar. When you have the stressor or something, I can literally almost feel it. 
something activates in my brain. I get more energy, become more productive, start thinking about new ideas. You know, I launched two businesses actually in the span of a month. Like I, I started somewhat working, you know, something completely <laughs> new to me. You know, I created this a portfolio of six cutting boards, six different designs and sold them all off Twitter. Again, like it wasn't a huge success. I made $2,600. Nevertheless, it's still, it, it's still interesting. It's still a good small win, a small data point. I doubt from the information that I got now from the little signal, I doubt that it's going to become a major income stream unless I figure out something different, maybe some more new marketing channel. But uh, sort of literally a couple of weeks afterwards, I had the idea for the, for the, for the course. And again, like, this is not like the, I, I've been thinking about doing something on this topic, as you know, like for, for over a year, I think, wondering what's the right medium, what's the right thing to do. But I think the fact that I had this little stressor from my income dipping below a certain threshold just helped me find the 80 20 rule, the right 20 amount, like prepare the Gumroad page. I didn't even tweet about it, actually. I just shared it with my existing customers of other products. And, you know, they, they booked and then I took it from there. Like I had no material prepared. It was all just in my brain and, you know, tweets and other sort of things scattered around over the internet. <laughs> and it was high intensity work. Right? Then I literally spent like a couple of weeks just, just thinking about it only. Right. I mean, I didn't really distract myself with other things. Uh, but it's, a, this a, I think this is an interesting idea, right? Because again, sometimes we're scared from the unpredictability and the variability, but I think we can actually use it to our benefit to find the right work-life balance, find the sort of new sources of energy and inspiration and, and things like that. Let me clarify for our audience, because you and I have had lots of conversations on one sentence you just shared, which is that you had nothing prepared. Now, of course, that may be true at a surface level, meaning you hadn't prepared a course concretely, However, underneath the surface, you had prepared quite a bit. Um, you had articulated many of these ideas in many different forums. And you and I, in fact, had a series of conversations on these very ideas on the order of four Twitter Spaces conversations that totaled up to something like 40,000 words of, of real rigorous thinking around this. So I, I, what I don't want to leave anyone with is the impression that they can start a cohort-based course without that level of rigor underneath the surface. So I think everything, all the information products I do sort of almost follow this pattern. Right? It's something that I, I would be talking about for free and public on Twitter, Twitter spaces, on podcasts, thinking about myself just without anyone else as well for months or years, right? Typically these topics get stress test. I mean, by, by, by the public most of the time, right? which is something that helps us well clarify thinking. This is one of the things I really love about Twitter, right? It's just everything helps. Like people asking questions, the haters, <laughs> the promoters, like the podcasts, the interviews, the questions, they just, they just stress test it, right? The, the, not just the idea, but just the articulation of it as well sometimes. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, and then it's sort of, it arrives to a point where like the course material almost creates itself. Right? And this is what I love. I, 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 and again, this is something we discuss in the course that I use, you know, sometimes procrastination as well as a signal that I'm not yet ready yet. So this, if, if I feel like I'm not getting that free energy to just do a brain dump and uh, the, the thing will almost create itself, it feels, I, I start to consider, and it's not always the case, this is an imperfect heuristic, but I tend to start feeling that maybe I need to wait a bit more. Like there's some gaps that are just too hard for me to, 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 to articulate. And yeah, it's, it's, so I think my three main successful info products so far sort of happened that way. The first was a technical book about programming about AWS. And this was basically a brain dump of 15 years roughly of experience with this technology. And literally was that. And I just, edited a little bit just to try to condense uh, the information. The second one on how to build that with the audience, the same thing, that right? was even more dense because it was just one hour or so recording. Lots of things that I had been tweeting and answering people's questions for free on Twitter. And I just 
prepared a few slides and just walked people to them with some real life examples. And this is more or less the same. Like this is probably this is the most elaborate thing I've prepared so far because you know it's nine hours worth of content roughly. And it's, you know, part of part of the in the fact that it's cohort based course as well. I mean, it 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 implies that there's you know more 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 detail right, about the topic. So I had to I had to work a bit harder, I think, instead of actually even just and figuring out how to how to present things, right? Because some things again just are are in my head, and you know what what works as a tweet doesn't necessarily work as as a live presentation. <laughs> you talked about stress testing your ideas against your audience or the public, as another way of saying it, and in conversation with others, in conversation on podcasts and so forth. So, so why don't we do that here? One. One area of criticism that I think your ideas could withstand is, well, sure, Daniel, it's all well and good to say that you ought to, you ought to try to put yourself not just in the right place at the right time, but in all places at all the time, as you say, which is a really cool way of saying it. And to, and to, you know, have this portfolio of small bets. If you've built up a nest egg a after having worked at Amazon, and you can you can have the sort of blanket of security financially to walk away, pursue your curiosity, and so forth. And great, Daniel. It's also all well and good that you have ninety two thousand followers on Twitter. It's pretty easy for you to monetize at this point. And I have my own. Like I could already answer that criticism for you on your behalf, because when I met you and as I have really understood your story, if you just, just roll the tape back a little over two years ago, none of this existed. Really, you had very small audience on the order of well less than 10,000. And you started writing these books in early 2019 or your first book, The Good Parts of AWS, to be followed by every one can build a Twitter audience. So why don't I leave that there? How do you do this without, you know, some significant amount of cash in the bank? You know, actually, I think the cash in the bank probably can even, I mean, this uh, can sound strange, right? but I think probably I had too much runway, to be honest. And I think it's some of the mistakes that I did in the beginning was that I was too idealistic, right? In fact, I, you know, I left Amazon. I had a good, healthy runway of over five years of expenses saved without needing to change my lifestyle at all. And I think, okay, I have all this time. I have all this knowledge and skill and experience in certain domains. I want to create my ideal business, right? And the biggest mistake that I did was that I thought, surely, the best way to increase my odds of success are going to be by focusing on something that I know a lot about. You know, I had been programming since I almost was five years old. That's when I did my first Hello World <laughs> program, right? And I had been programming for forever, 10 years almost in big tech. I focused on a particular domain of building databases. So I thought, sure, the, the best way to maximize the odds was to build a software business about databases, you know, doing programming and so on and so forth. And the problem was, again, like I was just too idealistic and I underestimated the role of chance and things that are unpredictable for a business to succeed. And luckily, I think at some point, about six months in, sort of focusing on this thing, I sort of had a little bit of a small crisis, panic crisis, <laughs> right? I started, I think the subconscious started nagging me and opening my eyes and realizing, are you sure you want to invest all the eggs in one basket? And sort of, what makes you think that this is going to succeed? What makes you so sure? When will you even know when this succeeds, right? I mean, all these sort of uh, things that I couldn't really answer, I couldn't convince myself about my level of confidence. So I think sometimes, again, it's like the variable income stressor. I think if I if people have a lower safety net, I think the sense of urgency will likely help just go for the low hanging fruit. You don't really need to create your ideal business, like your, your perfect reality. You just start with what you have and just try to gain more freedom, more flexibility. Sometimes it means 
compromising on some things. You know, for example, I recommend people to maybe one of the most sort of one of the best steps might be just to change your full-time employment to freelancing, for example. You might still be doing the same things. Sometimes you might be still working for the same company. You might take, your income might drop, but you might gain significantly more freedom because now you might be able to take two clients, three clients. You might be able to have something on the side without having to ask your employer for permission. Right? You just, just traded off something, but you gained things that are necessary to start sort of arranging your life sort of uh, in a way that better matches your, your preferences and your goals and so on and so forth. So of course, you know, you, you probably you can't jump, jump into this world if you're like living page, paycheck to paycheck and just you're on the brink of, you know, no, not making next month's land. So I think some cushion you need, whether it's six months or a year, or a year I don't really know, but I wouldn't let people you know, I wouldn't want this to stop people right, from considering taking the plunge because I think actually the, the stressor again of needing to, uh, you know, to make it work just tends to, 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 to help you. About the audience part, I think it's important to, again, like this, once you have the skin in the game, what happened to me? Again, I had two, two crisis moments, <laughs> like two panic attacks. One was that's one that I mentioned, like about six months. And the, the other one was literally in the first week where I realized that I was absolutely unknown to the world, right? I, 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 I just jumped into this world. You know, the only reputation that I had was in the companies that I had worked for before. And suddenly I realized, I mean, who's, who's going to listen if I put something out in the world? And even if they listened, if I, even if I was lucky and I got, you know, got some, some attention from, from public places, forums and whatever, why are people going to trust me? Like I just was completely unknown. So I think again, once you have the skin in the game, you the exposure to the consequences, you just start realizing something activates and you start seeing the missing things. And the missing thing that I realized I didn't have was I was just unknown. And Again, no experience doing it, no ex marketing experience, no experience in social media or getting attention or anything of that kind. I almost took the small best approach without even knowing it back then. I just tried many different things. I started blogging, going on Reddit, in the hackers, forums, Twitter, LinkedIn, Quora, everything. Some things I was getting some signal that there's something there, some things I was doing them, but you know, I wasn't liking them. Some things were you, taking me too much energy and I was, again, like wasn't feeling like they were returning some. And eventually sort of it's Twitter that stuck, right? Twitter stuck because I was liking it. It was sort of, I was seeing some feedback that it was working. And, you know, I kept even trying the other things for several months. It's only recently that I stopped bothering with anything else just because it, I, I mean, to be honest, not necessarily. I'm experimenting again, like with Instagram now a little bit, but sort of with less, less intensity or, or intent as back then. So, so it was, I think again, like it was important to, to, and this, this is something we talk about in, in my course, that sort of, you need to have like these assets to, to, and you can stack them, the assets, right? Sort of, you, 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 you might be able to write, you might be able to program, you might need to know how to market yourself, how to promote yourself, get attention. And once you realize there's like a missing piece, then you need to figure out how to acquire it, right? Not necessarily building an audience, you know, many people are able to get attention by ranking high in search engine results or by just personal networks. Right? Some businesses can just succeed that way, right? Just knowing friends and so on and so forth, right? Uh, lots of different paid, paid marketing. Many other creators on Gumroad, like for example, just make a very good income just with Facebook ads or Google ads and so on and so forth. So there's many different things you can do, right? But, you know, I, I think probably I wouldn't even have identified this. And this is an interesting point of reflection as well. It's just when I jumped in, <laughs> like when I exposed to the consequences of my actions, it's like suddenly it appeared that, you know, this was a missing thing. I might have been, I might have, I don't know, read about it before, but probably wouldn't have clicked until I was there in the game. <laughs> I have a follow-up question on a topic that you and I haven't really talked about privately, privately or publicly before. And it might take me a minute or two <laughs> to, to get across the idea. But 
but it actually starts from a from a a tweet that you shared recently that made me think and it, it goes something like this there are two distinct types of careers one where achieving success is highly accessible and predictable doctor programmer plumber architect for example the other where chance plays a huge role in achieving success musician author startup founder youtube youtuber and the again I, i'm going to keep pushing you here because the criticism is well, those careers where chance plays a large role, say a YouTuber, startup founder, musician, there, there is the notion of a starving artist for a reason. Not, there isn't room in the economy for every artist to succeed beyond the pale. And as we've seen on the internet, the power laws do rule and govern the outcomes. So there's going to be runaway successes on the one hand and a whole long tail of people who aren't succeeding on the other hand. Now, the car counter argument to that is the internet is huge and it is big enough for many people in many extremely small niches to succeed and to make a living or at least make a side income that is significant and non-negligible to them. And so that's a long-winded way of segueing to one point that I wanted you to get your reaction on. And this is a recent tweet from Sam Parr, where he said the following. I've been saying this, and I will repeat it. The creator economy is absolutely overvalued and much smaller than media people on Twitter think. Very, very few will work. It's a much worse ratio than other industries. Now, Sam Parr is at The Hustle and has my first million podcast. So the, the real question I'm trying to drive at with you is everything you've just said on this podcast would lead someone to believe, let's quit my job. Let's pursue these side interests and just sort of take a bunch of risks, make these small bets. If you make enough of them, like, a, like any good venture capitalist, one of them's going to hit. So which one is it? Is the creator economy huge? Is it, is it capable of sustaining this many independent creators or not? No, I, you know, I completely agree with, with sort of the same part sort of perspective. I mean, the creator economy might end up becoming huge, enormous billions of dollars worth and whatever, but sort of, I completely agree with the fact that it's almost certainly the case that it's going to follow the power law distribution of, of payoffs, like that there's going to be the vast majority of people making nothing and just sighing. And we've seen this dynamic everywhere in sort of these scalable professions, like the, the Hollywood artist, the book, the book author, the musician, it's always the same curve, right? And this is, this is what I described in that tweet as sort of the unpredictable world, right? the more stochastic world where it's a, a very hard to determine what, e who even the winners are going to be, even if you have lots of information. There's a very interesting book about this from the economist Art Devaney, who examines Hollywood, the Hollywood industry extremely uh, rigorously, right? And discovered that it's almost impossible to determine with all the information what Hollywood movies are going to succeed or going to sort of be the most profitable. Just, just so many variables, so many complexities. Like not even the, the, the type of stars who's going to start that marketing budget, just literally almost completely unpredictable. And same thing about, you know, who's going to be making a living or making the biggest profits in the creator economy. I think it's basically the same thing. I think what actually what I'm trying to inspire people to do, in fact, is to just not focus exclusively on the unpredictable world, sort of in the portfolio of small bets to do include predictable activities. I think sort of I'm trying to do this even using me as an example, right? I mean, actually the very first thing I did when I had that second anxiety crisis is to just go find some freelancing work, which I would consider to be sure freelancing is not exactly as sort of stable and predictable as a full-time work, but I think it still belongs in the predictable world. That's still something you, you get paid by the hour. You're not going to become a billionaire as a freelancer, right? You're going to charge hundred dollars an hour or 200 or something, you know, uh, along those lines and you only have 24 hours in the day, right? So it's not scalable. That's the very first thing I did, right? And they got a very small gig with a friend of mine who was doing like 10 hours a month, not, not even covering my, my, my mortgage at the time, but it was good enough as a small baseline 
even just psychologically motivationally to just help me. I think, for example, it's helped me give me the confidence to do the book then, right? So at the same time, because I had this thing, I thought if, you know, let's try the book. If the book doesn't work out, maybe I can do a bit more freelancing and so on and so forth. Now I have sort of the, you know, I left that and I have the gumroad sort of fractional job or whatever we call it, right? Which is just 10 hours a week, roughly. And, you know, it's just predictable part of my portfolio. Sort of I have this line that's sort of stable. Well, again, like it could go away for various reasons, right? And it's definitely not certain, but I could find other things like it. You know, even this co- cohort course that I'm mentioning, it's sort of a bit of a, a hybrid in between. Of course, this is something that I, I'm, I'm now able to do because I gained some attention from the audience and so on and so forth, and that was unpredictable. But now that I have it, again, it's like more or less not super scalable. You can leverage it because, you know, you're doing the course once and there's 25 sort of people in the cohort, so there's some leverage. But it's not infinite leverage, right? It's not like my other courses, my other info products where you make them once and you sell them forever. This one, I have to be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m., <laughs> be here and deliver it. And I'm getting paid by the hour, essentially. Right? So I, so actually, you know, what I want, what sometimes what I like, what I like to criticize is the idea that we should just pursue the scalable colors you know, the, uh, the make one, make something once and, you know, the, the, the passive income I- idea, right? Because of course, everyone wants passive income. Everyone wants to earn money while they sleep. But this type of activities belong into the unpredictable world. They're extremely competitive, extremely unpredictable. Even if they work, the sort of the payoff magnitude is completely unpredictable. Like I look back at my own products, you know, I had my, my Twitter course was extremely successful by my own measures. It made over a quarter of a million dollars in just over a year beyond my expectations. And if I would look back at, at what caused it, right? There were lots of things, you know, some retweets and some endorsements by some highly influential people who I wasn't even following, who I didn't even know they were following me just by some coincidence when I tweeted the announcement, they saw it, they bought it, they recommended it, and that made a big uh, sort of uh, improvement because then that snowballed into more other people buying it, more other people, you know, and this was all beyond outside of my control. It's very likely that if I were to go back in time to exactly the same things, I might get like a tenth of the outcome, very possible, like I little, little believe it. Or it could be the other way around. It could have been even someone even more <laughs> influential who might have been at the right place at the right time and I might have made $2 million, right? I've definitely seen creators get these types of payoffs in, in this space. So, you know, recognizing that tells me that I just can't rely on, you know, the predictability or anything, that I can... There's information to be learned from these small wins. That's why I encourage people to go to, you know, not focus too much on the upside, but go for the low hanging fruit. Probabilities matter. It's not just these asymmetric bets, right? But try to do something small, like don't try to optimize it too much. Because once you have something working, even though you don't really know exactly what made it work, it's possible to start replicating it and do something similar, right? This is, this is like, you know, I plant a, a tree in my garden and it starts glowing and flourishing. I might know, not know anything about the biology or what's making it flourish, but I might just plant another one in the same conditions and expect it to work. You know what I mean? And this is basically the world is super complex that we don't understand it. What causes things to work? What was it? Was it the price? What is the landing page? Was it the cover? <laughs> what was it? The, all these variables that need to be exactly right for the business to work. But once you get that small win, something did work, then I think you can have better odds by just trying to do something similar, right? And maybe with, with a different domain or just change variables slightly. And which is also leads me to sort of my point that I think with, you know, sometimes we tend to over glorify the, the failure. So we, we all like to say, you know, I failed, but I learned a lot. And sure. We do learn some things from failure, but I think we learn so much more. There's so much more information from a small win, right? It's just because, again, it's different type of information. This is not the type of knowledge that you 
it's like you know learning how to program or learning how to you know operate a machine that's sort of that's one kind of knowledge but this is a kind of knowledge of understanding what works in the world right it's not it's still probabilistic you're still never really sure if this is if this is helpful but once you see something working you tend to sort of be able to 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 replicate to do something similar and keep building on these successes right and you know, one, one p- property of this stochastic world, this unpredictable world, is success tends to bring with it other success, right? This is a phenomenon that happens in Hollywood and all in book, book authors and so on and so forth. You know, once you get this little small win, then typically things start to succeed even more. So again, sort of my sort of what I'm trying to promote is like have a portfolio of things, right? Because there is, it's impo- almost impossible to know what's going to work or how much it's going to work. Try to mix, weave in things that are more predictable so that you can gain peace of mind, right? You're not relying on all this wild uncertainty in your portfolio. And even the things that you pursue that are from the unpredictable world, just ignore all the big bets, right? All the long, big upside things. Just go for things that are likely have small, potentially limited upside, but they have like more chance of working, right? Just niche down, you know, lower your prices, whatever that's in your control to just get this little small win. This is another mistake that I see people do, right? They start to optimize too early because they, I think they start to feel like this is my life's work. I want to, you know, get the most out of it. But unfortunately, uh, if you try to optimize too early, sometimes you might, your thing might fail because of some, for some weird reason. Maybe you might you, you would have char- tried to charge too much for it and your reputation didn't really justify yet that price point. You know, it's, these are hard things to decide. I, I, who knows what that price point is? So again, sort of another thing that I tend to challenge that I didn't like to, to in price optimization. I would rather say give for free. Sometimes it's usually beneficial. Like there's this tweet that I retweeted yesterday, I think from Adam Wetton, He's an extremely interesting person. He said, like, giving away things for free is like a, sp- like a spring. Let me see if I can, because he, he articulated it really, really well. Giving away your work for free is like compressing a spring that releases when you finally put something up for sale. And he gave an example where, in his case, like he's been giving things away for free for like two years, him and his sort of partner. And eventually when they did release a product, they made a million dollars in a month. Of course, the million dollars is attributable to many things that are probably, we can't replicate, maybe not even them can replicate if we're there to do the same thing. So, so ignore the million dollars. But I think the idea has merit, right? You sort of, you, you, you increase your asset stacks, right? Basically now, not only you know how to program, you know how to write, but now you get a lot of attention. You, you sort of built your own reputation. That's what Adam and Steve did over there, right? Over two years. And suddenly they, they, you know, it's paid off. Like they put something out of for free. Nobody knew, not even them, how much of a success this was going to be, but it was looking likely. I mean, I remember their launch in 2018. I was following them, right? It was very likely that they're going to have some decent win, whether it was going to be a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars or $10 million or anything in between, or b- bigger than that, or smaller than that. It's unpredictable, right? So yeah, a long answer. I, I don't even remember the question, <laughs> but sort of hopefully it was sort of useful. <laughs> yeah, and I do have a concluding question, only because of our self-imposed time constraints. I, I fully expect you and I will have additional conversations on this podcast, mostly, but not only because the next two quarters at Gumroad are consequential in nature. Every qu- quarter is for every company, but there's been uh, a lot of things culminating that are going to be exciting on the product front. So I expect we'll maybe have a dedicated conversation related to product developments end of Q4 here and then Q1 2022. But, but you mentioned the word optimization, which is a very interesting one coming from your mouth. You talked about price optimization in particular, but I would like to end our conversation today on the idea of global optimization, meaning what you optimize for is not some product outcome, but rather 
you are a wonderful proponent of lifestyle design. And that's a totally different thing than optimizing on income or optimizing on anything other than what your life should look like. Mm-hmm. And so the specific thing that I'd like to, to say, which is a bit tongue in cheek, is you don't know necessarily what you'll be doing this time next year, so the end of 2022. But I would like to ask a simple question. What won't you be doing at the end of 2022? Yeah, oh, many things. Right? I mean, uh, you know, obviously, you again, I can't really console the future completely. So these are the things that I don't want to be doing. Maybe things outside of my console will force me to do them. But you know, many things. I don't want to be doing a full time job, for example, again, a nine to five regular job, working in a cubicle, working on somebody else's terms, commuting. You know, I want to be more present with my kids. So, you know, I don't want to be an absent father, for example, right? I don't want to, you know, be doing purposeless things. This is something you still do boring things. Sometimes when you're working for yourself, there's still lots of stuff that needs to be happened. That's not necessarily fun, but at least I don't do anything meaningless or purposeless. Everything has a meaning, right? So many things. Yeah. And this is a good point. I think typically we tend to improve my, our lives more reliably by eliminating the things that we know we dislike rather than trying to go after things that we think we will like. <laughs> Again, just probabilistic perspective of things, right? There's probably just more reliable information about something that we've already experienced and we realized we hated, <laughs> right? And trying to get it out of it. Well, Daniel, thank you for spending time with us. It's precious and I know you like to remain unscheduled. It is, it is a dream for all of us. So, And indeed, you and I scheduled this on a moment's notice, which is further proof that you're living the principle (laughs) that you're espousing. So thank you again, and we'll talk to you quite soon, Dave. Thank you, Justin. Thank you.